afternoon. Uh, in trying to describe my life uh, during World War II here in Alice, it was uh, it was so peaceful and so calm and so unthreatened and all. I I thought it might be even inappropriate to tell about those times without acknowledging that, of course, we wouldn't have had that, couldn't have had that without the sacrifices that. Some of you and some of your families must have made at the time. We, we didn't, uh, weren't threatened by that in any way other than a few ration uh, coupons and restrictions of that kind. I, I grew up uh, from about eight or 10 years old up to 14 during World War II. And um, on December 7th, 1941, 1941, I was in the fifth grade Grammar school, as we call it, class at that time, Miss Emily Etheridge. Um, I guess I ought to also explain that uh, how we happened to be in Alpha at that time. Uh, turns out my family was here uh, at all because of the railroad, the Frisco Railroad. And uh, my grandfather uh, was in the uh, railroad construction business. He built railroads out of uh, Missouri, Illinois, Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Arkansas, out in there. And um, my dad, in fact, was born in a railroad car in the little town which later became uh, Frisco, Texas. Uh, my grandfather, at one time before the railroad went bankrupt, had his own private railroad car, and that's where my dad was born. Uh, when he got, my dad, that is, when he got out of high school, um, my grandfather sent him to the University of Illinois Engineering School, where he, uh, during his senior year, made the mistake of buying himself a suit with some extra money he had. My grandfather, being a very strict, uh, restrictive, even uh, un unfeeling kind of man, took him out of school for that. He told him he had to go to work. And he went to work for the Frisco Railroad. Yeah, it turns out they were building a line Frisco was from Amory Pensacola when he came through here and met my mother. Uh, and they were married on October 14, 1927 here. And um, that's that's how we happened to be here at all. You flash forward to 1941 where I begin to describe World War II. And uh, my dad was in the you know, sand and gravel business here. He also had a sand and gravel operation in Childersburg, Alabama. You may remember some of you having read that history uh, that Childersburg at the time was in the construction boom, construction boom itself. They were building a tremendous ammunition factory and powder factory on about uh, 13,000 acres near Childersburg. And he went over there with the dredge to produce sand and gravel for that construction. He was also producing sand and gravel here during that time for what was called ballast on the railroad. Ballast is the term they use to describe the aggregate that's put around the cross ties for stabilizer. Uh, also before Pearl Harbor, we had, uh, I talk about we because my dad did all that, and I like to take credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we had a planter mill and a sawmill here. He was uh, making uh, lumber that was shipped mostly by railroad to uh, places shipping uh, crates, using shipping crates to send their supplies and uh, heavy equipment overseas to uh, Europe and other places where the fighting was going on. Um, the day that the uh, first train came in to unload prisoners uh, down uh, on what was then Highway 17, uh, we were sitting on, I was sitting on the hood of a car in uh, Marvin Turnipseed's front yard. Marvin lived uh, next door to the railroad on the, what would be the Northwest corner of the intersection between Frisco Railroad and the highway then. Uh, I was there, my dad was there, mother was there, Karen, my sister Karen was there, 
and uh, Miss Daisy all day she was at the time. Of course, we all uh, were curious about what the prisoners were going to look like. We, uh, my impression was there was some tired uh, soldiers, uh, probably wearing uniforms they'd had on since they left uh, North Africa. Um, anyway, they got off, and a lot of your families had, had uh, descriptions related to you about how they looked and and so forth. A lot of that is including in, included in the book uh, that Mrs. Cook has written about that time. And uh, having gotten off, they marched off down the uh, highway to the camp. Later on, we would uh, have those same prisoners uh, picking cotton on our little piece of land on the west side of town. Uh, they would uh, eat lunch under the pecan trees out front there. My sister Karen remembers uh, visiting with them and they're trying to uh, teach her to count in German. She, uh, she was just fascinated by them. And um, eventually one of them, uh, an artist by the name of Hummel, drew uh, portraits of herself, of Karen and myself, which are little pencil drawings hanging on the wall out here in the museum. They were, uh, she thinks, they were made on the front porch there at our house. Uh, I, I thought they were done at the sawmill where they work. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, those sketches are out there. Um, the prisoners uh, pretty soon began work uh, at our sawmill and planer mill and the logging operation. Uh, one of the things that really sticks in my mind is that watching the uh, crew uh, prisoners begin their first day logging. Uh, we were across uh, what is now Highway 17 from the airport behind what was then uh, Cliff Horton's house. And uh, we assembled down there and uh, someone, I think probably James Lee, who worked for us at the time, You're, some of you may remember James Lee and Lowell Bell, the family that uh, was here a long time. I think James Lee was explaining to them, and then through an interpreter, how they would cut the log, how to notch the tree, how to make the cut so the logs would fall in a particular direction. And uh, short, short-lived uh, time thereafter, uh, they gave, uh, gave them an ax and a uh, cross-cut saw and they <coughs> just went right in cutting logs. Uh, it it kind of struck me when I was thinking about that, uh, what, um, what we would do with the nicest prison of the day. Uh, can find out whether we give an ax or a saw or whatever <laughs> to uh, take off with. One thing the president never were allowed to do was uh, handle the mules. We had mule teams, I say two minutes, we had mule teams to uh, pull the logs in. Uh, if you didn't have your handle mule, you know, geez, right and paw is left. Never could get the prisoners to understand the mule and the mule to understand the prisoners. <laughs> they never did get to do that. Uh, I'm going to try to, to uh, wind up. Um, uh, oh, my dad did uh, make the mistake of uh, having a barbecue and some beer for a few of the prisoners and got in some difficulty with the administration down there for that, but he, could, he never could understand why uh, anyone would object to having a party, so. <laughs> uh, one thing, I, I, uh, one other thing I wanted to say was that uh, a couple of those pictures uh, on the wall, drawings of the sawmill and planer mill, uh, brought to mind that uh, what we use then was steam plow. Uh, the, the, the planer mill itself had uh, a uh, conveyor that took all the shavings into a, a boiler, and the boiler, of course, created the steam that operated the whole mill on one big, uh, what seemed to me, uh, 
a huge flat belt pull it in, but I, I wasn't that tall, so it may not have been as big as I remember. Um, my first job at the sawmill was sitting on the left side of the drawing that you see out there of the sawmill, and I was given a tally sheet, which is um, had one to four, or one to six, one to eight, and so forth down the left side, times up, and, uh, and uh, put a dot down for each piece of lumber that came out of the hedger. Um, the one uh, relationship that existed over the years uh, for my dad was uh, uh, a uh, glass commander at the uh, camp who was a Colonel Greer, and he and my dad got big, big, big buddies, and uh, and they hunted pheasants together all over uh, North and South Dakota in later years. Um, that's uh, my time. I enjoyed and appreciate the uh, the invitation to talk. And I know Clyde and uh, John will have a lot more interesting things to say. Our second speaker today is a longtime area resident and World War II veteran, Clyde Marine. Thank you. Uh, I'm trying to stay in nine hey, minutes. <laughs> uh, my home is in Panola, unless if you don't realize that, but it's 16 miles down the road. Uh, it's the hub of the universe for us, you know. But John Lee lives in the suburb of Panola. <laughs> so what we really wanted years ago was to get a, another county down there, cross the river county. You know, we have some good cross the river parties down there. Now. We like to have a county that went from Tom Bibby River to the Knoxville River, make us a separate county. But so far we haven't ended up yet. <laughs> When I was growing up, they had a, Panola had 10 stores, a doctor's office, a railroad round table. The railroad went from the farm to Panola, turned the engine around and went back for a while. And not little, not many little towns had a round table. But after a little while, they uh, pushed it on to York. And I don't know if that, that had something to do with that or not, but it was Aliceville and uh, Cochran were named for the people that helped build the railroad. Uh, we had a little school, a wooden schoolhouse, had three rooms in it. Every year they'd come by <clears throat> just before school started and all the floors, you know, just pour all over and mop it out. And about uh, 1939 they did that. We started the school about uh, uh, in October, I don't remember, some guy came rushing out and said, the school's on fire. We all ran out and, you know, looked and it was burning just like a pine torch with it. And my brother Jack was in the fourth grade then, and he got a new uh, uh, lunchbox. And we had to hold him from keeping him going back and getting his lunchbox. <laughs> and Tommy Rogers was you know, in the arithmetic class then, and he ran out with the arithmetic book, and he looked around after the thing melted down. I went over there and pitched his book, and I said, no, Rick, I don't need that no more. <laughs> We went from there to a little four-room house and like the throws to death and then they CCC camp closed and they took the camp down and built it over behind where our community center is now. We went to school there for two years and then I moved and came to Alice. We went through nine grades in Panola and then we come to Alice in Sumter County to furnish us a bus and then we catch the Pickens County bus on up here. And we had great teachers in Panola and we had great teachers here. And I uh, graduated up here in 1944. I was 18, 17 years old then. And I would like to go in the Air Force, but back then they, they, you, you didn't have a choice anymore. The war wasn't going that well, you know, and they, they put you where they wanted you. Uh, Daddy had bought a house after radio, shortwave radio, and we listened every night and to hear Big, Big Ben strike. Uh, and Edward R. Murray was broadcasting and they said, what was going on? They were in London terribly, you know, and all the news was bad, but we listened to Big Ben at 7 o'clock, it was 12 o'clock over there, and uh, and Daddy and Granddaddy had maps and they kept up with all the, <clears throat> where we were fighting in North Africa and everywhere else. But uh, 
They were bombing London and they intended to break the will of the British people, but they didn't. They just made them worse. And Churchill was a great leader. He saved the Western democracy, I think, because he helped Britain to hang on for several years, two years at least, while we weren't doing anything. We didn't want any part of the war again. But uh, Roosevelt was trying to get us to lend him some help and had this lend lease. Because Roosevelt said, if your neighbor's house is burning, you'd loan him a hose and let him put the fire out, and then you'd get the hose back <laughs> so after the war, after the fire was out. So they, that way they got some lend lease going. And Roosevelt, I mean Churchill, was a great speaker. He said that the British people were the heart of the line. He just furnished the war. <laughs> he did. He, he kept them. But he also had some great sayings. I couldn't get by all that. He said his uh, lady asked her. I don't know whether she's in the uh, House of Commons. Who is she? Anyway, they didn't get along. And she told him one day, she said, if I were your husband, I'd poison you. He said, if I was your husband, I'd take it. <laughs> Another time he was watching Big All going by, you know, he was about 6'4", and he thought, he said, there, but by the grace of God, goes God. <laughs> uh, and we, an induction center in Alabama, we were Fort McClellan. We went up there, stayed two days, got in the road, went to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, and they issued us uh, uniforms, which were all two sizes too big, and uh, had wool. We burned up in the world. We went up to Florida, then to Camp Landing, Florida. Uh, I met Bud Spiller on the train going to Florida, and we were great friends the rest of our lives until Bud passed away. But uh, Bud got mumps just as we were going to pack, pack up and leave, so I left him down there. I didn't see him left the war, so. But uh, we were training for infantry replacements because the Battle of the Bulge was going on, and we lost 19,000 men killed in the Battle of the Bulge and 40,000 wounded, and they were just eating up infantry, and the average life of an infantry replacement then was about three days, because they didn't have training, and, and they just wasn't ready to fight. Anyway, Patton, General George Patton, they got him up there, and he said he wasn't a religious man, but he prayed one night, he said, Lord, if you will let the skies clear and the, and the uh, planes come in, I'll do anything you want after that. <laughs> And so the next morning, the skies were clear. And he evidently had some effect on the <laughs> uh, We Anyway, down there, we had a corporal of Rucker from New York who was our platoon sergeant. We thought he was terrible, but I realized later that he was just trying to save, our, save us, you know. And I'm down to four minutes now. <laughs> we were issued an M1 rifle, and they were all worn out the barrel looked like a pipe. You, know, you couldn't keep them clean, but any time they wanted a KP or something, they'd look down your black belt and boy, you're gone. But uh, if, you, if you dropped it, you had to sleep with it. My rifle number is 1810165. So that's seared in my brain, and when I die, it'll still be there. <laughs> uh, but we left there. <clears throat> well, I do. They asked us to volunteer one time. One of the rules in the Army do not volunteer. But they wanted us one day for the two truck drive. I said, oh yeah, I'm not okay. So he took me out behind the office there and there's two steel wheel carts with steel wheels about that high, filled with everything we going out two miles out in the sand, you know, about that deep. So I learned right then not to volunteer. I, didn't want to uh, I had a 10 day, I had 13 weeks of training there. I had a 10 day furlough. I went to uh, Fort Robinson, Nebraska and joined the canine crew. They came through and asked if they really needed desperate, they needed canines men and dogs, so I went out there and spent 16 weeks <coughs> learning to handle dogs, mostly scout dogs when you're working on a leash. And anything ahead of you, if there's so many of right, you can tell about how far they were out there. And then he had a uh, messenger dog, they put a uh, packet on his neck and as soon as he buckled it up, he'd take off back to the lines. And uh, we trained them by letting them work against the wind. And, uh, Every day we put on, had a great big suit. You've seen pictures of a padded suit. And uh, you, you turn the dog loose on the guy with a padded suit, and we had to take a turn about it. But we had a big old guy 
in our outfit from Pennsylvania, uh, <clears throat> Buck, Burroughs, I think it was, but he got more than his share because as soon as the dog started for him, he'd scream and fall over. Oh, he'd kick out of there. He'd do some for you pretty often. But anyway, we were scheduled to leave our train the 15th of August. On the 6th of August, they dropped the atomic bomb, and we just, everything sort of, we didn't know what we were going to do. But in uh, the 12th of August, they dropped the second atomic bomb, and in two or three days later, Japan decided to surrender. And that saved my life because we were going to land on the beach over there. You know, I, the dog had been first on the beach, and I'd been second, but I didn't, I didn't realize at the time <laughs> that was what was going to happen. But anyway, I, I, I didn't get the uh, Hirohito tape the surrender speech, but he, um, he put it up, and they were the, the uh, generals didn't want to surrender, so, okay, one minute. All right, I got to forget that then. <laughs> I learned to fly while I was in Manhattan, Kansas. I still got my pilot's license. I came home and I was, we borrowed $750 and put it down, paid it on a new bulldozer and started out, thought we were going to get rich, you know, and we didn't. But we worked at it we were, and I was going down the road by Mr. Smith's house one day and looked out and there was me in a Montevallo gym suit, breaking hay with her. Then it's old tractor, and I said, oh man, they like this truck. <laughs> <laughs> and it was terminal, I never got it. And, uh, we had 63 years of a wonderful marriage. She died a year and a half ago. But I've got a great family of four children. Russell got killed for three daughters, and <clears throat> got me under a tight rein. I've got four grandchildren and four great grandchildren. And I've had a, a Agony and ecstasy of raising a family, you know that. Everybody's raised a family, no that. But I'm, I don't have many regrets in my life. And God bless all of you. And it says, with this last thing, all it takes for evil is to win is, to, is for good people to remain silent. And we can't remain silent. We've got all these things that happen in the world. We'd like to back away from them, not do it, but we can't afford to. And, uh, <clears throat> this is my cigar and I'm speaking to you. <laughs> Our third speaker today is John Lee Jr. Uh, from Dancy, Alabama. The, the fact that um, I, I'm John Lee, I grew up in Dancy. If you don't know where that is, then you're not from this part of the country. <laughs> <laughs> it's an, I guess a suburb of Panola, but Cochran, Dancy, Panola, Warsaw, we all part of a big metropolis. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that uh, we are enjoying being here. And there's so many people who uh, Clyde talked about didn't make it back. So uh, <clears throat> we owe a tremendous debt to those, to those folks who are not here and not able to be enjoying this. I was nine years old, um, two or three years younger than Pep, when um, Pearl Harbor uh, happened. My dad had bought a house from Mrs. Baker and Dancy, and we were in the process of trying to fix it up once on that Sunday. And we had an old battery radio hooked up to a car battery sitting on a stump out in front of the house where um, yeah, I was born and we were listening to the radio as we moved and all of a sudden the news came over about, about Pearl Harbor and later on we listened as uh, Franklin Roosevelt um, gave his famous speech about uh, getting into the fight. Somebody said, what do you remember most about World War II? Well, of course, I was a kid. I was even a younger kid than Pep, okay? Um, I was like nine when it, uh, <clears throat> eight or nine when, it, nine when it started and 12 when it was over, 12, 13. 
But what I remember most, what's most impressed on my brain, is that everyone was involved. This was a war that everyone was really committed to. It wasn't like <clears throat> today where you have uh, uh, just the people who are fighting and maybe their families involved, the rest of them back home living a good life. Uh, it was a total involvement. People were away fighting in the, uh, all the men, mainly the eligible men were off in war, uh, in the Army and Navy, Air Force. And uh, even the women, some of them would join the wax and the waves. Uh, some of them were, uh, some of those who couldn't get in the Army or were too old or had physical problems or whatever, they stayed home and did work here. Uh, the excess labor was quickly used up uh, out of the farms, out of the countryside, in town. They were all working in factories and that sort of thing. Those are the rivers of the real. Um, so uh, people were all involved in it. Not only that, everyone seemed to be talking about the war. Uh, kids at school, <coughs> teachers at school, uh, parents who were listening to the news every night. We're all caught up in this and we're all committed to it. Uh, there were scrap metal drives. Uh, Jimmy McBride was just telling me about his dad um, getting loads of scrap metal uh, that time. We had rationing stamps uh, so that uh, just because we were home, we couldn't just go buy anything we wanted to. We had to have stamps to buy gasoline, to buy ammunition, to buy tires, to buy uh, sugar, flour, I think maybe lard. All these things were rationed when you could get them. And when they did, supplies did come in, then of course you had to have a, a ration stamp to get them. And John has some ration stamps here at the museum. Um, so every family almost had either a brother, a sister, a father, uh, a neighbor, a good friend who was off fighting in the war. And we were very, very conscious about the dangers that they faced. And now and then, of course, there was some bad news. And uh, those were very sad times for all of us. Um, same was true at school. Uh, the um, teachers had relatives at war. Um, some of them had husbands at war. The uh, students had parents, some of them, brothers, sisters, relatives uh, away at war. So they were very conscious of what was going on there. And we were, that was the talk of the day. That was the main topic of conversation at that time. And the um, stories that we heard on the playground, the things that we uh, talked about as kids, uh, mainly from the elementary school up here, go out on the playground and, and everybody told war stories. Some of them they made up, and some they told that they'd heard from their parents or their brothers or relatives. And you heard some that were grossly exaggerated, but uh, nevertheless, that's all we talked about. As we walked from the elementary school to the high school for lunch, we had to do that. Uh, then uh, that was what we talked about on the way over there and on the way back, talking over there. New children joined our class, right, Marilyn? We had people who joined the class uh, who were uh, children of people who had come to work in the camp here at Camp Aliceville, or there were uh, ladies in the military, families that were here, people were just working at the camp. So we had people come in. Uh, that were not from here and joined the class. So the class numbers swelled, and soon as the war was over, they disappeared. They were gone. Uh, in town, of course, at that time, business was pretty good because uh, there was a lot of demand for things during the war. They didn't make as many consumer goods in because all the towers and the new equipment, new cars, new trucks, you couldn't buy them. They didn't make them during the war uh, for us. They were uh, made for all military use. And so uh, the repair shops were busy. Uh, J and S Motors, as uh, Johnson Speed, um, Mr. Roy Speed, I remember going there all the time, taking broken things in there and getting them to weld them back. A lot of welding, a lot of fixing was going on at that time. So business was pretty good in town, uh, and people who were uh, had businesses here were working hard trying to find things that they could uh, sell. Um, Teachers at school were trying to keep up everybody's spirits. Uh, but some things went on. Like Duff said, life was normal and not bad for us as a kid. It wasn't bad. We still had our 4-H calf show down here on Boyd Street, right down before you get to the intersection down here at Main Street. A block off the street with 4-H shows. The movie theater, we 
had cartoon, we had newsreel, and newsreel was always by the same company. I uh, can't think of the name of it, but that's one way we kept up with what was going on in the war. That was the only visual thing we had. We had no TV then. Simon Jones Drugstore was busy. Uh, two, more, two summary points about everybody being involved. Everybody was committed, but you know, it wasn't just the people who couldn't afford to get out of it. You had movie stars, politicians, uh, people who were, had been in Congress or whatever, the state politicians, they were on there side by side. Some of those people were in the trenches side by side with people who had no, no claim to fame. So everybody was committed to it. Uh, there was no, no draft dodges, nobody running to Canada to get out of the war. Uh, and even the, we even paid for it by selling bonds and stamps and that sort of thing. We borrowed from the American people. And so when the war was over, the debt was over. It was owed to whom? It was owed to us. So that kept, was kept internal, so not borrowing from China and that sort of thing. One of the big differences, I think, um, I always said that if um, we had a major war today, if we required that the first people to go would be the senators and uh, representatives and their children, and um, everybody that made over a million dollars a year would be the first to go, and you had to pay for it with current taxes, with the war would be over real fast. <laughs> but uh, there's two final comments here. Uh, I won't say much about Camp Alice, Pep's already talked about that. I was standing right close to him that day those prisoners arrived, right about in the same yard, watched the prisoners get off the train. Um, we had some prisoners working on our farm, and I had some quite interesting stories. I put them in uh, my book, back there, Born Rich, but I was born rich. No money, but I was born rich. Um, but I, I'll just tell you one, uh, one short one. I won't tell you the whole story because my time is up. But um, this was the story I called The Great Escape. My brother Jimmy and I were out one Sunday morning before church time, playing around in the pasture about a half a mile from the house on Highway 17, with a big curve in the road as you come into Dancy. And we saw these two men walking down the road. And we liked to play detective and all this kind of, no, we were kids. And we snuck behind some bushes and watched these two men walking down the road. And when they got close, we, it said P.W. Uh, on them. I don't think it said P.O.W., I think it said P.W. And we looked at them, and Jimmy turned to me, and I turned to him, and he said, those are escape prisoners. <laughs> we took out, we went not close to the road, back into the woods behind, all in a big circle around the house, down to my granddad's store and dance on Sunday morning. Everybody was um, done. <laughs> uh, anyway, we told him that, Prisoners were coming down the road, and my dad was standing out there with a bunch of other men. They're waiting for the Sunday paper to come so they could shut up in the store and all go to church. Well, they didn't believe it. Pretty soon, they came the prisoners walking down the road. They all stood there like this. <laughs> Nobody moved much. You know, and finally, they walked on by, and someone, my dad, someone said, we've got to capture them. <laughs> and so they, uh, they, everybody ran to the house close by and got whatever gun they had, shotgun, hunting guns, whatever. They jumped in two cars, all had guns to get, it looked like two uh, Spanish Omota. They go down the, down the road, and they'd gotten about three quarters of a mile down the road, and they got behind them, and, and they were still walking along, ignored, the prisoners ignored them, and uh, just two of them. So my dad shot up in the air, and um, when he said halt at first, twice, and they never halted, he shot up in the air, and he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. They turned around and said, don't shoot, don't shoot, you know. And the uh, point was that they thought they were going to New York to get a job. They were going to New York. <laughs> they said, we want to get a job for after the war. We think the war is going to be over. We want to get a job for after the war. Well, they marched them all the way back down to my granddad's store, called the camp, and the uh, camp said, we don't have any prisoners busy. We checked again. We got two up here. And turned out they checked again and said, hold on, we'll be there shortly. So they drove down to Nancy. Meanwhile, everybody put the guns down. Everybody was sitting in the big circle talking and laughing and telling jokes and stories. And it was just um, sort of realizing, you know, like seeing these prisoners, that they're all human. Let me tell you this. I know my time's over, but the day it ended. <clears throat> Miss Frances Summerville was our sixth grade teacher. And we were in that class. And 
It was, uh, she was worried because her husband was in, in the battle. I think he was in Europe, maybe, I'm not sure. And we knew she was worried about it. We had a vague idea that you know, he was over there somewhere. And we were sitting in class one day and the door was shut. She was talking. I heard this terrible racket out in the hallway at the school. Some kid was running down the hall, 90 to nothing. My first thought was, Miss Etheridge is going to kill this kid. <laughs> she allowed no running in the hallway, no noise to be made. Anyway, bust through the door and he came and said, the war's over, the war's over. And it was VE Day. It was Victory in Europe Day. It was in May, 1945. And oh, he jumped up. We were hooping and hollering. Everybody was jumping up. We just forgot all about class. You know, there was bedlam in there. Somebody turned around and saw Miss Francis. She had her head down on the desk and she was just boo hooing. <clears throat> Um, and pretty soon we, frankly, we saw that, and we all gathered around her, and uh, we laughed and cried with her. But um, well, I never forget the day it ended. Thank you.